In this video, we'll explore the accuracy of the Gauss elimination algorithm. After studying this video, you should be able to explain why the Gauss elimination algorithm can be vulnerable to round off error. Make sure you watch the finite precision video first so that you are familiar with the idea of round off error in finite precision numbers. One important point I want to make up front is it's not necessarily common for round off error to be a problem with Gauss elimination, but the key is that it's something that's possible that can be a big problem and we need to have some ways to look out for it. So we want to identify cases where Gauss elimination results are likely to be inaccurate due to round off errors and also look at one thing that we have to look at for a matrix solution in determining its accuracy and that would be the res residual and this is a similar idea to the residual that we talked about for roots problems. So recall that Gauss elimination is a direct method. We ha didn't make any approximations in developing the algorithm so how can it be inaccurate? And as I said before it's generally very accurate but there are some characteristics of the algorithm that make it and some characteristics of matrices that make it possible in certain cases for Gauss elimination results to be in fact very inaccurate. So here's some of those cases. For one, the algorithm includes many repeated additions and subtractions and so round off error can accumulate as we keep adding and subtracting the same numbers. Recall that the number of operations is proportional to n cubed for an n by n system. So potentially, say a 100 by 100 system, we could be talking about 10,000 operations. So those round off errors that are on the order of 10 to the minus 16 can accumulate and become significant. Another situation is that some matrices are ill-conditioned. And what we mean by that is that their solution is especially vulnerable to round off error. So consider this example, just a two by two system and solving it in the first case, the results are X1 is 45 and X2 is 130. And the only thing that's different is one coefficient, changing that from 3.84 to 3.84 from 3.85 and we see the solution is radically different. And I want to emphasize here that this difference in this example is not a result of round off error. What this difference indicates is that if we do have a small round off error that we see in the coefficient matrix as we go through the elimination steps of Gauss elimination, that small round off error, here we have something that's a less than 1% difference, that small round off error is leading towards a very significant difference in the solution vector. So that idea where a small round off error can lead to large deviations, that is the case when we have that we're talking about when we talk about an ill-conditioned matrix. So let's talk a little bit more about how can we tell if a matrix is ill-conditioned. Well, there are a few things that we can look at. First of all, we can just look at the matrix elements. Do they vary by several orders of magnitude? So this is an example of a Vandermonde matrix. where if you look at this, if you think about an X being 10 and, uh, sorry, 100, 200, and 300, this matrix has the form of X to the 0, X to the 1, and X squared in each of those rows. And so we can look at that and see that from the third column here to the first column there we are spanning five orders of magnitude.
in other words, from 10 to the 0 to 10 to the 4th. And that's an indication that as we go through the elimination steps, we're going to have cases of adding a large number to a small number, as we discussed in the finite precision video, adding large numbers to small numbers is one case where we can have that round off there. And through the repeated additions and subtractions in the Gauss elimination algorithm, those round off errors can accumulate. So inspection is one approach. Now, inspection is not going to be very helpful um, if we have something like a 100 by 100 system, because it's just too tedious to go and inspect that element by element. So we would like to have some mathematical tools to do this. One is to look at the determinant. If the determinant is close to 0, that indicates that the matrix is close to singular. And again, that is a case where we might have round off error problems. And that would be in this example over here, this case, that's the determinant is close to zero for this example from the previous slide. The last thing we can look at is we can define the matrix condition number. And that is a built-in MATLAB function and there's potential here to really kind of open a can of worms in this class of theory that I don't necessarily want to get into but I do want to talk just enough about what a condition number is so that we can use that as a tool to e evaluate whether or not a matrix might be ill-conditioned. So the idea of a condition number is the default for MATLAB using the built-in function COND is it's the norm, again there's the double brackets, it's the norm of A times the norm of the inverse. And we can have a condition number based off any different number of norms. Recall we talked in the previous, uh, in a previous video about different types of norms. Uh, we can talk a little more in MATLAB that uses the mo the default is the most common uh, matrix 2 norm condition number. And the matrix 2 norm is a norm that we didn't talk about previously. The way that that's defined as is the square root of mu max. Now mu max is the largest eigenvalue of the product A transpose times A. Again, like I said before, this is potentially opening up a can of worms. Now we've introduced another term, eigenvalue. We are not going to discuss that. I'm going to leave the idea of eigenvalues to your linear algebra class, Math 260. And uh, just know now that this matrix 2 norm, also called the spectral norm, it's the minimum norm of the matrix A. So it's, that, it's a scalar value that gives us a sense of the magnitude of the matrix. And it's, since it's the minimum norm, we can think of it as the tightest measure of the magnitude of that matrix, since it is the minimum norm. And again, this is the default if you use the default norm used for the MATLAB function condition of A. So let's look at what happens when we look at take the condition number of some matrices we've looked at. So here's some example condition numbers. Uh, first is this Vandermonde matrix, which is a notoriously ill-conditioned matrix, and we see that that condition number is on the order of 10 to the fifth. We know that that's an ill-conditioned matrix. Here's the matrix that we, the two by two matrix that I presented earlier in this video. And doing that condition number, we get a condition number on the order of 10 cubed. And then lastly, here's a condition number, and this is the matrix we were working with in the Gauss elimination video. And this is on the order of 10 to the zero, or um, the order one. And in general, again, without getting too deep into the theory here, the
the bottom line is that a condition number is much, much greater than 1, that indicates that the matrix is vulnerable to round off error. It doesn't guarantee that we're going to have round off error problems, but it indicates that round off error might be a concern. So that is our main conclusion that condition number is based off the spectral norm. We're not that worried about what does the spectral norm mean. Since this is an applied class, the key here is just knowing we have this condition number that describes how the matrix is vulnerable, whether or not the matrix is vulnerable to round off error. So let's move on and talk a little bit about how we can measure the accuracy of the end solution. Now we don't know the true solution because we're solving a matrix. We're solving for that true solution. So the best that we have, similar to the roots problems that we talked about before, is to look at the residual as a measure of accuracy. So in this case, the residual will be a vector. So we might also look at the norm of the residual as a measure of the accuracy of the solution. So for the true solution, we know that when we that it solves the equation a times x equals b, which we can rearrange as b minus ax is equal to 0. When we solve for the numerical solution, we're going to have a times x with our numerical result. It's going to be close to b, but we know if we've got some errors due to finite precision, as we've discussed, that it will be approximately equal to b. So we can rewrite this as b minus ax numerical is equal to e, where e is our vector of residuals. And again, it's important to note here that this is an error. What's left over by plugging our vector x back into the linear system, and we should end up with a 0. It's not a direct measure of the errors in our numerical solution. But you might look at this and say, well, but can't we use that to come up with a direct number? Let's try it out. So we know that the actual error, so here would be the actual error in our x vector, in our solution, it's going to be equal to x true minus x numerical. And we have those two results. And if we solve for b, we can take our ax true and plug that in here and we get ax true minus ax numerical equals e. We can factor out the a ax true minus x numerical equals e and you could say, oh, no problem. Now we have a linear system to solve for that air vector, right? Because this right here, oops, sorry, this right here is ET. But the problem is, is solving that system especially when we're really interested in the air, A might be an ill-conditioned matrix. Solving the system uses that coefficient matrix again, and it introduces additional air. So, not a good idea. So we won't go any further with this. We will note that we still do have the residual, and that residual value, it can be an indication of error problems. So it's still useful for that. So let's talk about some conclusions. So one is even though Gauss elimination is a direct solution method, the results are not necessarily accurate all of the time. But again, with the caveat, most of the time, we are fine.
Most of the time, it's plenty accurate. Again, those double precision numbers are precise to 10 to the minus 16, so they're pretty accurate. The main cause of inaccuracy in the solution is round off error and when that accumulates. Again, because we have repeated additions and subtractions. We talked about some matrices being ill-conditioned, which means they're especially vulnerable to round off error. We can tell that by inspection, by looking at the determinant, but the most common robust way to do it is to predict problems with the condition number, and that's a built-in MATLAB function. Condition of A, if that is much greater than 1, then we have some concern. The best end measure of accuracy that we have for a numerical solution is going to be the residual vector. In other words, taking our numerical solution, plugging it back into the linear system, and seeing how close is that residual vector to zero, which is where it should be. So we just wanted to cover some potential issues with linear systems so that you are familiar with these when you encounter them. And that concludes this video.